Ah, it is a good day to be church, yes? yes? It's very good. It's very good. So our sermon scripture is going to be throughout um, the sermon. So if you could please join me, um, join me in prayer. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Good morning. It is so good to be church today. I know this seems uh, uh, like an odd question after this baptism here, but the question that I have to ask when I approach these texts that we will get to is, how did we mess things up so quickly? This is our last Sunday in Easter tide. Easter is not just one Sunday, it's seven Sundays liturgically speaking. So next week we're going to have Pentecost and then we'll be in ordinary time until Advent. But the text we have is the beginning of the book of Acts, and Luke is the one that writes Acts. And so it's the start, it's the, it's the beginning of the movement, the beginning of the church. And um, so we're going to break down those, those, those first couple texts. But how did we mess things up so quickly? Once Jesus leaves the scene, it's like the disciples eventually, and eventually the church, just start running in the wrong direction. And so... Before we get to our text, let's, let's take some stock of how we got to the place we are right now in Acts chapter 1. So Jesus comes on the scene and immediately starts crafting a worldview that does not line up with power or privilege or empire or religion. Made such a splash and everybody was being invited to dinner parties and speaking in front of large groups of people. He had wild ideas about loving the unlovable. Caring for those on the bottom. Jesus talked to them, the disciples, about this new kingdom. But it wasn't the empire of Rome. It wasn't a religious system based on rules and who was in and who was out. It was a community that would change the world by enacting love. In this kingdom that Jesus called it, in this kingdom, the first will be last and the last will be first. The poor will be blessed as well as the hungry and the naked. Revenge goes away and we respond with compassion and love. And where we break bread together and do life together and God is made known in the relationships. And because he was a direct threat to the domination systems present, they killed him. God was not about to let that be the last word. And so resurrection becomes a reality. And then if we enter into the gospel stories post-resurrection, which they all kind of go in really different directions, we see the resurrected Christ being revealed among the faithful, behind locked doors, on the road when breaking bread, at the beach, at breakfast time, and consoling those who mourn. It is with all of that that we have our reading today, at least a portion of it. This is the beginning of of the book of Acts. It is right before the resurrected Christ ascends into heaven. So let's take a look, starting on verse 6. So when they had come together, they, meaning the disciples, asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it's not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Might we stop right there? These disciples have experienced the fullness of Jesus' teachings. Teachings that go against the domination systems and of empire. And they seriously just asked Jesus Okay, Jesus, is now the time that Israel is restored and God's mighty hand will crush our enemies? That's what that question means, by the way. And I don't know if Jesus ever sighed loudly, but if he did, this is the time he would do that. What are you talking about, he should say. We've been talking about this peace-filled movement, not the kingdom of Israel being restored, and the Holy Spirit's coming, by the way. Maybe it will sink in then, Jesus asks. Let's go on to verse 9 here. When he had said this, 
as they were watching, he was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight while he was going. And they were gazing up towards heaven. Suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way you saw him go into heaven. All right, so this one is a little more metaphorical. But Jesus ascends into heaven after telling them to go, go and bring forth the kingdom. Every time you gather, do so in remembrance of me. Love each other. Go actively love each other as I have loved you. Wash feet, bring food, heal the sick, clothe the naked. And what do the disciples do? They just stand there looking up in the clouds. They stood there so long, apparently, that God had to send two angels, or men in white, or however you want to say it, to come alongside them and go, hey, move it. This is what we're talking about. Quit staring up in the sky. Let's go. You've got to be about the work. Get to it now. Let's see how they do. In verse 15, in those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 people, and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those arrested, for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. We're going to skip to verse 21 because they talk about how Judas died, which is a wild story in Luke. It's not the same thing as Matthew. So one of the men who have accompanied us Throughout that time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us. One of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. And they proposed two, Joseph called, Bar- called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. That is the wordiest thing. <laughs> and it says almost nothing, but this is what is going on right here. It's confusing as to what's happening, but basically, they got back to Jerusalem, they looked around, and they had 12 seats, metaphorically, but only 11 apostles. Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus, had died. So their first order of business was not to do anything that Jesus taught or did. Their first order of business was to make sure the committee was filled. Oh my gosh. No one is telling them to fill that seat or something. There's no magical number there. And I know we need to be about the work of Christ, Peter says, but we clearly have to make sure we're in compliance with our bylaws. How much does that sound like church? So they had two options for this cherished seat that no one was telling them to fill, by the way. Let's see how they did on deciding such a thing. Verse 24, then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. So they went to God and asked God which one God wants them to fill this vacancy. Do you know what God said? Nothing. God didn't say anything at all. Here's what I think happened. Jesus ascends into heaven in glorious fashion and takes the place at the right hand of God. And kind of stretches a little bit and goes, well, ah, what do you think of that? That ought to fix things, right? And God goes, Jesus, I don't know how to tell you this, but these disciples of yours are literally asking me which one should fill Judas's spot in the committee. And Jesus would say, well, did you answer them? No, God would say. They're so far off the mark, I don't even know how to handle these people. So then what do they do? Let's look at verse 26. And they cast lots for them. And the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the 11 apostles. So when God didn't respond, they just left it up to chance. 
They, honest to God, rolled dice to see which one would be the honorary 12th man. It took these disciples less than a day to abandon Jesus' kingdom vision and turn God into the magic eight ball in the sky. <laughs> should Matthias choose? Should we choose Matthias for Judas' spot? Signs point to yes. It's insane. It's insane. They missed it over and over and over again. Now it is so easy to point our fingers at them, but the church has been missing this mark for the last 2,000 years. I believe one of the main reasons that church misses the mark is because sometimes we forget why we exist in the first place. It's certainly not to fill committee slots or choose which color chairs to have in the sanctuary. And by the way, the chairs you are sitting in right now was a point of contention many years ago <laughs> with the color that they would be. I did not want them to be the color that they are right here. We had a committee that was, this is years and years ago, we had a committee that was split right down the middle. And we spent a ridiculous amount of time on what color our chairs should be. And you know what God was saying up there? Hey, Jesus, they're doing it again. <laughs> <sighs> so my dad was my baseball coach for like nine years. And that was the only team that I'd ever played for, first grade through ninth grade. But there was a couple times that I was picked to play in a tournament by another team. It was just a couple times that that happened. So the first time I was picked up by another team, it was like the sixth grade or something like that. So my dad, before all of our games, would have a team meeting before every game, and they'd go over the game plan. He'd go, all right, guys, gather around, gather, and we'd all, we'd all get together. And, and he'd go, guys, this pitcher's got a nasty curveball. But, you know, he's got no control over it. So when you see the curve, wait on it. Make sure that's going to get in the strike zone before you take a shot at that, right? And the third baseman, I've been watching him, he can't field the ball very well. So if you hit it to third base, run all the way to first. You'll probably get there. And outfielders, hit your cutoff, men. The ball's hit to the outfield. Now get in here and let's have a good game. So we'd all get in there and say, go Rangers or something, right? I had never experienced a team meeting from another coach. And so I'm out there. It's the first game of this tournament. I'm so excited. I don't know many of these kids. So the guy goes, all right, come, gather in, gather. We'd all gather in, right? And this is, this is a true story, by the way. He goes, guys, I don't know how to tell you this, but we don't have any sunflower seeds today. And most of the kids go, ah, like that. And the, kid, and the coach goes, I know, I know. Johnny was supposed to bring him, but he's sick. What do you want us to do? All right, there's no sunflower seeds, but we have bubble gum. We got a lot of bubble gum right there. You see it? And if you need the black stuff under your eyes, you go see Tammy. She's got a lot of black stuff to put under your eyes here, all right? And then there was a hand that goes up. And he said, coach, what about the beef jerky? That was the question. And the coach goes, guys, we got two flavors of beef jerky here, but the packages are really hard to open. So find an assistant coach and they'll help you out. All right, everybody get in here. Let's have a good game. <laughs> How quickly we forget why we are here. When I look at the greater landscape of what passes for Christianity, I can't help but think that we have lost our way. Most of what passes for Christianity in the West has forgotten why we are here. And I'm quite bewildered by it. As a student of the New Testament, especially the Gospels, I'm bewildered by what we've done with this. The Christianity of Jesus left people with more dignity and greater care, with healed wounds and fuller bellies, with calmed fears and quieted worries. It left a wake of compassion. I think we do a good job here at Forest Park, and I believe we are way ahead of the curve, but we aren't immune to forgetting why we are here either. If we listened to Jesus and we paid attention, the whole of Christianity would look so different. If the church actually followed Jesus, 
then Jesus would be a model of living instead of something so pure and so perfect that we couldn't possibly attain. If the church actually followed Jesus, then affirming our potential would be far more important than condemning our brokenness. If the church actually followed Jesus, then reconciliation would be valued over judgment. And if the church actually followed Jesus, gracious behavior would be valued over that same judgment. And if the church actually followed Jesus, meeting needs would be more important than maintaining institutions. It would care more about love and less about sex. If the church actually followed Jesus, it would be peace that is more important than power and compassion would rule the day. Jesus came to show us this alternative yet beautiful way that we should be interacting with all of God's creation and with all of God's children. Let's remember why we are here. So some of you know my mother's story when she was the principal at Eugene Field Elementary School in Tulsa. So when she arrived at the school, Eugene Field had the lowest test scores of the entire district, all of Tulsa Public Schools. So she comes in as a newer principal, and to combat this, one might try to get better teachers. Maybe she's go in a clean house and get teachers that can teach or take out the extracurricular activities so there could be more time to study. Or bring in experts and show new innovative ways to teach reading and writing and arithmetic. After all, that's why they're there, right? That's why the kids are there, to get an education. She could have taken that approach that academics needed to be bolstered, but she didn't. She didn't take that approach at all. She remembered why they were there in the first place. It wasn't to learn multiplication tables or diagram sentences. It was to create an atmosphere where children could thrive. Isn't that the point of education? To create conditions where kids can thrive and be the best versions of themselves. So she threw out the playbook as to how best to teach reading and writing. And she came up with innovative ways to build community where children could thrive. She immediately partnered with local schools, with local like faith communities for her school, uh, for food and feeding programs. A different group would come in and have community meals in the school all the time. And the meals were for everyone, not just the students. It served several low-income apartment complexes. The community would show up and have these meals. She made sure there were enrichment programs every single day after school. She opened the building every weekend. To, uh, to serve these low-income apartment complexes and the families that are a part of them. Partnered with some philanthropic people and organizations for an affordable grocery store because the community didn't have access to healthy food. Global Gardens came in and helped families plant and maintain gardens. There was an assembly. She had an assembly every single day. She actually started school before she was supposed to and had an assembly every single day and made sure that kids that had birthdays were sung to and celebrated. Now, from the outside looking in, none of those things had anything to do with science or social studies. But my mother remembered why they all became teachers in the first place to enrich the lives of children and create conditions that they can thrive in. Those test scores, by the way, they went through the roof. By the end of her run at Eugene Field, her school had the best test scores in the district. Not the most improved test scores, but the best test scores. And by the way, those scores were better than the elementary schools in Jinx, Union, and Broken Arrow as well. We can get so lost sometimes when we forget why we are doing this. The disciples almost immediately forgot. The church forgets why we are here more than it remembers. So let's remember why we are here. 
It's not to join a club. It's not about believing outlandish things. It's not about conforming to the world. It's certainly not about protecting the institution. It's about enacting love. We can so often get caught up staring into the clouds and then asking the magic eight ball to guide us. Enough of that. The way of Christ is our salvation. And this salvation is available to everyone who enacts love. And by the way, Jesus doesn't care what you call this enacting love. Doesn't even care if you mention his name, by the way. That's biblical. I'd love to debate it with you sometime. And that's why we baptized seven young children today. It wasn't to wash away the horrible sin of these deplorable elementary school students so that God can love them now. Maybe one of them, but not the other six. No, just teasing. No, just teasing. (laughs) This morning, seven of our young ones chose to remember why we are here They've been nurtured and cared for by this church. And again, in turn, they wanted to further the work of Christ by participating in an ancient ritual where you die to self and you are raised with Christ. That's the question I asked each one of them. Not do you want to wash your sin away, but do you want to participate? Do you want to have a ritual where you say, I want that. I want the Jesus way, and I want to choose to make the world better through that Jesus path. All of them said, I'm in. Not by asking God to eliminate enemies or staring up at the sky or rolling the dice for the Lord, but by bringing forth the kingdom of the Most High, and by enacting love everywhere they go. Thank you for being church who has nurtured children. Thank you for being a church who has nurtured adults. Let us remember why we are here. Amen.